Okay, it's wonderful to uh, to be here in uh, in Atlanta today, and certainly all eyes are in Georgia as we're watching uh, the uh, results of your runoff election in the U.S. Senate race. Um, and so I know that this is a particularly busy time uh, for you, not only with the election today, but also uh, with the holidays. And I'm really so pleased that so many of you are here. Um, in fact, the uh, 2008 election and its outcome uh, here in Georgia and across the country is one of the themes of my uh, comments today. I want to discuss the role of public broadcasting in this new era that we're entering, including the special role of localism and community service work that we do across the country. I also uh, want to share a few thoughts about this wonderful station and the work that it does and, um, and some of the content that we are jointly creating. And, and I do want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, something that John raised, which is the whole issue of technology and how it really is reshaping the way that we think about our work. And if I haven't droned on too long, hopefully I'll leave a little time for some questions. I um, um, had a wonderful discussion over lunch, and I, um, I have to tell you, you've now raised the bar because your comment about Kevin Close's uh, remarks at one of these earlier lunches terrifies me. <laughs> Um, Kevin Close, for those of you who don't know him, is the recently retired head of NPR, National Public Radio, and was a journalist, spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union, and has amazing stories that I think some, sometimes I think are made up. Um, actually, I know they're not made up, but they, they could be out of a, uh, a Robert Ludlum uh, novel, and so I always make a point of never following him. So the fact he was here some months ago gives me a little bit of solace. Um, but I think uh, to talk a little bit about public television and, and where it's going, it, it helps to actually look back. Um, and because I think with everything else in, in life, I think history matters. And I think that as you look at public broadcasting and you consider the fact that it was really born of the belief that television could do more, much more than entertain, but it could also illuminate and inspire and educate and entertain too. And for more than 40 years, that's exactly what we've done. Uh, we gave America Big Bird and Mr. Rogers, demonstrating that TV could serve as an effective tool in teaching and learning. Uh, we brought you the News Hour, which is still broadcast television's only hour broadcast, and I think does set the standard for television and news coverage in terms of fa fairness, balance, and context. We took you under the sea with Jacques Cousteau. We took you into the kitchen with Julia Child. We took you on the opera stage with Luciana Pavarotti. And we took you to places that perhaps you hadn't considered exploring before. And as we look forward, I think we continue to try to take you on new adventures, whether it's the battlefields of World War II uh, brought to, to uh, audiences across the country through the great work of Ken Burns, the world of Jane Austen, which was the centerpiece of Masterpiece Theater last year. Masterpiece, I have trouble with its new name. Or the history of the Native American experience, which is going to be one of our great miniseries coming up this spring, brought again by the Ameri American Experience team, uh, a new series called We Shall Remain. Like schools and libraries and colleges and universities, I think that PBS and our public television stations <laughs> try over and over again to prove um, that we can do things that the marketplace itself cannot. Um, I, I view us as really a trusted companion on the path of life, taking viewers places that they wouldn't go and showing them things that they hadn't seen before. And I think this is particularly true here in Atlanta. I look at the scope of work that PBA does in this community, and it really is an essential resource in, in, in connecting the community. And it takes some of the great programming that we provide through PBS, and again, which all the stations create together, and it lays that against some really terrific local programs. I was driven in by Alicia Steele from the airport today, and I know that um, her program, This is Atlanta, is a great part of your schedule. And, um, and moving on, and, um, and actually when we talk about new media, this is a place where PBA is spending a lot of time thinking about how it can provide additional content uh, into the community. 
Something that PBA does that um, probably some of you know, of course, if you know it of its school board roots, this wouldn't surprise you terribly. But I'm always surprised when I travel around that most people don't realize how much work public television does directly in the schools. I was given on a cook's tour of this facility right before lunch and saw the room where, uh, which is the nerve center, I think every school day afternoon where homework hotline is, uh, is coordinated, where teachers give direct um, feedback to kids. Uh, we're the most used uh, video material in the classroom. NOVA, by the way, is the number one video that's used in the classrooms. So education is very much a, a big piece of our roots. And, um, and we're committed to that because we feel that there's a lot that we can offer. Kids are saturated with media. And I think to be able to take our storytelling skills and the kind of work that we create and use it for educational purposes both at home and in the classroom is, is tremendously important. Um, we're an interesting organization, public television. When I took this job, uh, a lot of people said to me, wow, this is really something. You're running 356 stations. And when I listened to your introduction, I almost believed that for a minute. <laughs> I don't run 356 stations. They run me. Because what PBS is, is actually it's a membership organization. And we were created by the stations around the country to serve them. And so all of the work that we do, we do with the intention of trying to make, make each of our public television stations as strong and as relevant in their communities as they can be. Each of our stations is completely independent, very autonomous, believe me, very autonomous, locally owned. And this is tremendously important because in media today, there are very few locally owned media operations. And I think that because they are so rooted in the communities that they serve, they really do understand those communities in a profound way and really do make a great effort to try to serve the people in the community in a way that only someone living in that community would understand. And I think that as you look at um, education as just one example, and as PBA really thinks about how it can really bring the education to life because in, in education probably even more than politics it's very local. No one else could do the kind of work that PBA does because they understand this community in such a profound way. Um, we are very proud of the awards that we've won this year and I appreciate you sort of ticking them off. The um, ten, den 10 Daytime Emmy Awards um, that we received um, marked for the 11th consecutive year the fact that we've won more uh, awards for our children's programming than any other broadcast or cable organization. In fact, Sesame Street itself has won more Emmy Awards than any program, not just children's program, any program in television history. Um, the 10 news and, and documentary Emmys that we won this year, um, that was more than any broadcast or cable organization. CBS was our, was our closest competition. They won five, and they won most of those for 60 minutes for one particular show. Um, but the, the thing that I, I'm the proudest of in terms of the things that we've accomplished this past year is actually um, uh, the trust that the American people put in us. And uh, we participate um, each year in an, in an annual poll that's conducted by the Roper Organization. It's an independent poll. And <clears throat> in 2008, for the fifth year in a row, we were ranked – PBS and our member stations together were ranked as America's most trusted institution above courts of law or the federal government. I know you're laughing. Maybe the bar's not so high. Or major newspapers. Um, and, and the second best use of federal taxpayer dollars, um, second only to our nation's defense. Um, I am very proud of the difference that I think we're making in communities across the country. And so my top priority is to make sure that we do everything we can to make sure that PBA is as successful as it can be. Um, and so my uh, work that I've taken up is really been principally focused on three key content areas. And I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about um, what feels that it's surrounding us, which is um, news and public affairs. Um, it's no secret that, I, that this election um, was really remarkable in so many ways, and including the fact that voting levels were at near historic highs. 
But the interesting thing about this election was that Americans didn't just vote. They also volunteered. They went door to door. They connected with one another online. They staffed phone banks. And it's interesting because this engagement around this election is also seen in a broader resurgence in civic engagement that we're seeing around the country. Now, I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir here because I bet that most of you sitting in this room are not only contributors to the station, but are also volunteers and heavily engaged, if not here, in the community itself. But for some years, volunteerism was, I wouldn't say teetering, but had, had sort of plateaued. Um, volunteer levels over the last couple years have soared. And if you look at organizations like Teach for America, they have waiting lists now of kids that want to participate in Teach for America and go into urban schools. I think that's extraordinary. Peace Corps, record number of people that are going into the Peace Corps. And by the way, not just kids, but people including a former colleague of ours from public broadcasting that left his job working for NIDA and went to the Middle East as a Peace Corps volunteer at the age of, how old do you think he is? 60, I think. So I think that um, all you have to do is sort of look around you, and particularly here in this community, and you see lots of people that are deeply engaged. Last year, almost a million Atlanta citizens donated 150 million hours of public service. Um, so by donating time, um, Atlanta volunteers made an estimated annual economic contribution, I'm looking down because I want to make sure I get the number right, of $2.9 billion. Clearly, good citizenship is on the rise, and Atlanta is helping to lead the way. And I think that this is great news for all of us, and particularly for public broadcasting is the proud home of series like The News Hour and Frontline and Washington Week. Uh, we attempt on a day-to-day on -day basis to, pro to try to provide Americans with news, as does NPR, and context. And I think that is tremendously important. In fact, the Roper poll that I cited a few moments ago ranked our public affairs programming as number one in terms of fairness and objectivity above CNN and NBC and ABC and all the major news organizations, Fox. I think it's, um, I think it's really um, something that we don't take lightly. And each and every day as we think about the work that we're creating um, in news and public affairs in particular, we feel a great obligation to try to uphold the high standards of journalism that we see slipping. I see slipping everywhere. I, um, I don't know about you, it's disturbed me tremendously during this last election period, great news organizations that seem to have forgotten the difference between news and point of view. And that's why I think that for us in public television and for our colleagues in public radio, it is tremendously important for us to stay focused on the principles of good journalism. This is my speech for tomorrow, by the way. Um, and, um, and because I do think that it matters tremendously. And I think as we look at our work moving forward, um, I obviously have um, been very um, focused on making sure that throughout this election process that we are rising above soundbite journalism and really trying to get at the issues. But I think our important work now lies ahead of us because the election is just the beginning. And now we will be looking at a new administration, at a new Congress, and I think it's up to all of us to make sure that we are reporting as the real work of governing begins. Um, and as we continue our work to be good stewards of the public's trust, I am also very committed to honoring our, our history and our historic commitment to the arts. You know, when President Johnson signed the Public Broadcasting Act in 1967, he spoke eloquently about the hope for public broadcasting as sort of a modern Greek marketplace where democracy could take place in view of all citizens. I think it's really important to remember that the Greek marketplace wasn't just a home to politicians. It was also a home to artists and, and poets and writers. And I think that as I think about our work, I, I, I've always felt that the performing arts and the visual arts have really been integral to civic life. And I think in some respects really helps define a civilization. Um, I, I, I use this quote often, it's my favorite, um, by Hans Christian Andersen, I think who says it better than, than anyone. And he said once, where words fail, music speaks. I think it really does, the arts bring us together, help us understand both our similarities and our differences and our roots and our culture. And I think in public broadcasting, if you look at our work over the years, 
we have done amazing work. Millions of Americans would never have an opportunity to see a symphony without public broadcasting or to see a dancer soar across the stage or to feel like they have a front row seat at a place like the Metropolitan Opera. And I speak from experience. I grew up in, um, outside of Baltimore, which you probably guessed from where I went to school. And um, when I grew up in the 60s, I had some opportunity. Uh, my parents would take us a couple times a year to, um, to the theater. But, um, you know, we didn't have huge amounts of money. We didn't have the resources to go to see lots of things, particularly for a, a family of five. Uh, but in my house, we watched a lot of public television. In fact, I remember, remember those days when we used to sit around in the living room and watch the box together. And, um, and so for me, growing up, um, I remember sitting on Sunday nights watching Masterpiece Theater and watching my first ballet performance I ever saw, I Love Dance, was something that I saw on public television. So for me, this was all very much a part of my life before it was my job. And I feel that the love that I have for art was really kindled by public broadcasting. And I want to help kids growing up and people that live in parts of the country that don't have access or don't have the economic means. I want them to have the same opportunities that I had. And so what we're working to do is to take not only the great work we're already doing, but we're looking for ways to bring more performance onto public broadcasting, and not just from places like New York. You have an amazing, rich artistic tradition here in Atlanta. I would like to be able to showcase more of your work nationally. I would like to be able to travel, as I do across the country, and bring some of the great performance to a wider audience. And then, of course, the third area that we're, we spend a lot of time thinking about worrying about is our kids' programming. And, um, and I know that this is always an upsetting thing when I say it, but um, next year, Sesame Street will celebrate its 40th anniversary. <laughs> How many of you want to pretend you don't remember when Sesame Street came on the air? <laughs> I used to lie and say I was a Sesame Street kid. I wasn't, but my brother was. And uh, we watched a lot of television together when I was uh, babysitting him. And, um, and I think that as I was a young uh, person, Sesame Street was um, was of interest to me, but for my brother, who was the right age for Sesame Street, it really did make a huge difference for him when he entered school ready and willing and excited about learning. And so that sort of revolutionary spirit, because when Sesame Street came on the air, it was different than anything else. Oh, thank you. It was different than anything else that had ever been on television before. It was fast-paced. It was something that parents enjoyed watching. That's one of the secrets of Sesame Street, by the way. It's designed so the parents want to watch with their kids. Um, and it really changed the way that people thought about the possibilities of, of what television could do to help children learn. Well, we have tried to think about that pioneering spirit that was that inspired Sesame Street. And over the last three years, we've added eight new series to public television. If you don't have little ones around, maybe you're not aware. Curious George is not only in the top ten of children's programming, it's the number one show for children under age five. Sid the Science Kid, which comes to us from the Henson family, so we continue that great legacy that, that Jim started, um, is a program to get kids excited about science and learning. And I think as we look at the future of our country, getting kids excited about science and technology is going to be tremendously important. We should start when they're really little. And Word Girl, my personal hero, is, um, is a little girl who is, in fact, a superhero. And uh, she, um, she fights the evildoers by using what? The gift of language. It is a great program that not only encourages kids um, to um, be excited about learning language, but it also is a great program, particularly for little girls. Now, next season, um, actually in January, so just in a few weeks, uh, we will bring back, and there are a couple of you in the room who are young enough, um, that this will have special resonance. We will bring back the electric company. Yeah, they were all sitting over there, I saw. And uh, the electric company, uh, which I, I think for so many kids was such an important part of their childhood, has been, uh, the core of it's the same. I won't yell, hey, you guys, into the mic. Uh, but it has been changed and reinvented to really be relevant and exciting for, um, for today's kids, and we're excited that it's coming back. The, 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 the core behind all of the programs we create for kids is that they're all curriculum-based. They're all heavily researched. 
if you watch public television programs, they're entertaining, but you know that there's something different than, well, they're certainly profoundly different than SpongeBob, but they are different than what other programmers try to create because our goal at the end of the day isn't just to entertain kids, though we have to do that because they do control the remote, and if they don't like something, they're going to click past it. So it has to be really entertaining, but it also has to have a curriculum underpinning, and that's not so easy. Uh, but um, we have a great track record, and we're really excited about the work that we have moving forward. But when you talk about the programming that public television does, whether it's for public affairs or the arts or for kids, it's really important, and, and John talked about this when he showed his little device from his pocket. It's not just about the TV in the living room. It's also about laptops and iPhones and regular cell phones and all kinds of ways that people can access material. Our goal is really to try to be where our viewers are so that we have content available to them how they want to use it. So if you go onto the PBA website, for example, is they're doing some really interesting work. So if you haven't spent time there, go there. Because they have been looking at um, streaming material, which is what we're trying to build out with some of the rest of our stations, and really thinking about ways so that, yeah, it's great if you're home at 9 o'clock at night and the program that you happen to want is there and you can click on it. Or, you know, it's great if you know that a program is coming on and you've found a 16-year-old or 12-year-old that can show you how to program your TiVo and you remember to tape it, but wouldn't it be great if at some point you want to look at a program, you could actually go to PBA's site and click and download it and stream it and watch it where you want it. And as, um, and I do have, he's not 12, but he feels like he is, a um, guy that has, um, when I moved to Washington, my husband and I decided that we needed a little technology. This is always a bad thing when you talk to a young person and say, I want a little technology. Actually, what I really wanted was speakers so I could hear music in my apartment. <laughs> Um, much too much money later, um, I have a television that I can operate, but it is connected to an Apple TV. And, um, and what, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I can take anything off of the Internet and watch it on the television set in my family room. And that is here. And so the opportunity to be able to pull stuff off of PBS site, whether it's national programs or a really great local piece, you've got one tonight on the Terracotta Warriors, that's a little promotion, and make sure you call and make your pledge. I'm going to be on TV tonight, and if no one calls, I'm going to be really embarrassed. Um, anyway, it, it's, it, it's, that technology is here. And so for those of us in public television, the commercial guys are really thinking about, you know, how can we make sure that every person in the country has seen Lost and seen the ads around it? For us, it's taking all of the scholarship and all of the work that's gone into creating the programs that we build and getting it to people that may find it of help or that may find it entertaining, sure, but also inspiring. Um, I worked at a station that did a lot of production, and I was a fundraiser for many years, as you, told, you could tell from my endless bio. And I worked on, there was one project I worked on, it's one you might remember, um, it was a documentary that was done on the Broadway musical called Broadway. We worked on that for 10 years. Eight of it was raising the money for it. And it was a hugely expensive program to produce because it had so much footage. And the biggest cost in so many documentaries is all the rights to acquire all the music and footage and so forth. And so... It was great that we broadcast it to a national audience and lots of people had a chance to see it, but just think about a kid that's studying West Side Story in high school and then to have a chance to actually see the original production, I mean, or a piece of the original production. To me, that's really exciting. And so as we build out our work in this area, we really are very um, jazzed if we can figure out how to, you know, sort of fit all the pieces together because for us it's a great extension of our public service mission. Um, I guess I'll just close by, um, by saying this. I, um, I love, um, I was just telling John earlier today, this is actually my last station visit. I'm not leaving my job, but I am getting off the road for a while because I've been traveling for the last couple of years. And um, we have a lot going on in Washington right now, so uh, I want to be there to make sure that our case is being heard on the Hill. And so, um, um, but at the thing that, although my husband is really happy that I'm not traveling, um, 
I miss, I'm going to miss these trips because the thing that I love the most about this job is all the people involved with public broadcasting. I love working with the producers and talking to them about projects that they have that they're just starting to think about. You know, it's just there's that, that moment. We all have it in the various things that we have passion about, but that moment when they're just starting to think about a project, that's to me, that's, that's, it doesn't get better than this. It's also meeting people in communities across the country and hearing the things that they're working on um, and the things that they care about within their communities and then meeting the people at the public television stations that are trying to tell those stories. That's really been the gift of this job. I have seen this country in a way that I think very few people have an opportunity to do. And this country is, um, and I think all of the press so often focuses on the negative aspects of of what happens in our society, but this is a country where there's so much exciting work going on in schools, in cultural organizations, in community development. And for me, the one commonality as I've visited around and spent time in studios across the country is, is the people that are connected to public broadcasting are pretty special. They're, um, in many, I've met people that were involved in putting stations on the air. You know, some of our stations have been around for a while. I know this one has. Some of our stations are only 20 and 30 years old. I actually was at a station in uh, Salt Lake two weeks ago that was celebrating its 50th anniversary, and there was a guy there that was one of the people that put the station on the air and was involved in getting the license and raising the money. And the thing that sort of ties us all together is that we all have this belief I, I think we share a couple of beliefs. One is I think we believe in the possible. I think that's why we're connected to public television. I think we believe in um, the power that something like television that really has such great reach, that it can be something that can bring us all together. And I think we also all recognize that um, like our national parks, and that's Ken Burns' next big series um, in September of, of next year, 12 hours, six part series on the history of the parks. It's really the history of the people that made the parks, by the way. And, um, and he always says that it's his best work. He says that after every film. This is my best work ever. Um, I'm not sure this is, but it, it, it will come pretty close to some of the work that he's done. These are all things that I think we sometimes, it, it, it defines us as Americans. You know, volunteerism is so much a core of who we are. That's not necessarily uh, a, a global phenomena. Um, I think that, you know, with our national parks, if you travel around the world, so many sacred and special places in the world are actually in private hands here. We, we own them together. And it's the same with public television. We own this asset together. This is not John's. It's not mine. It's, it's ours. And it exists because we together believe that it's important. And so um, as I wind down my station tours, I, um, I'll share with you one story, uh, which is a story that I've told almost every place that I've gone because it's my inspiration. And, um, and it's actually not my story, it's, it's, it's actually yours as well. Um, I worked for uh, 13 years in New York at uh, WNET, which is also known as Channel 13. I also started my job on March 13th or some, I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, the um, Right before I left the station, I, um, a friend of mine had been doing a lot of work with um, the largest soup kitchen in New York, which happened to be two blocks away from, three blocks away from the station in New York. Um, it was run by um, uh, Holy Apostles uh, Church. And so one day at lunchtime, I went over and was walking through. And, and um, um, when you spend any time on television, and you were just telling the story, and I was smiling when you were telling it, because it's absolutely true. If you do anything on television, one appearance. People recognize you. I saw you. you know? and, um, and in a place like New York, when people look at you in a funny way, it's not always a good feeling. <laughs> so, um, so I'm walking through the soup kitchen, and a couple of the, of the men, as I was walking through, um, nodded to me. And, you know, I nodded to them. And I saw this guy across the room, and he was staring at me. And, um, and at first, I, you know, sort of looked over, and I realized he was still staring, and I got a little uncomfortable. And then I saw him coming across the room, and I thought actually he had confused me with someone else. 
And because he had this look on his eye like he knew who I was. And, um, and as he was getting closer, I could hear what he was, cause he was talking as he was going across the room. I could hear what he was saying. And, he, and what he was saying was, I can't believe you're here. I've been wanting to talk to you. And then I was sure he had me confused with someone else. <laughs> and as he got a little closer, I heard what else he was saying. He said, you're Channel 13. And I said, yes. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, I have wanted to meet you for a very long time. He said, I used to live up near Lincoln Center, and I used to, um, to go to a lot of performances there, and I used to travel um, a great deal. And he said, but I've had some difficulties in my life. And he said, and now I'm here, meaning the soup kitchen. And he said, but you, you are the window of the, on the life I once had, and you have no idea how much that means to me. Thank you. I share that story because it isn't my story. It's our story because together we built public television. We make the programming possible. And I can't tell you, and I'm sure that every person in this room, either as a volunteer or as someone who's worked in public television, has had those moments, or, or maybe you're just a donor that just can't stand getting that extra letter, and you think, is this really worth it? We all have those moments. And some mornings I get up and I think, you know, this is such a complicated job, you know, and I always think of that guy. And he always brings me back because the work we do is profoundly important. I have had people tell me stories of how their autistic children's minds were opened by Big Bird. I've had people tell me stories about how they decided to pursue a different career because of something they saw on public television. I've had, I had a guy tell me that he finally figured out how to make a souffle because Julia Child, when she was doing that thing with Jacques Pepin, you know, did this whole thing on how to make a, a, a souffle. And he said, I know it seems small and, and, and silly. And he said, but it's something I always wanted to try and I realized it wasn't so scary when I saw her do it. We really do make a big difference in people's lives. And I think particularly in this day, as things are so complicated and so sometimes so difficult to understand, Public television, even with all the other channels out there, is so profoundly important. And we're able to continue to do the work that I feel is so needed, that I think you recognize is so needed, because we have the support of great people like you. So this is not a build up to a fundraising pitch, though again, you better call tonight. <laughs> um, what it is, is, is a big thank you. Because you're obviously in this room because you are supporters of public broadcasting and preaching to the choir, literally. I know you're true believers. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of all the people across the country that do count on public broadcasting as the window of, on their life. You make a big difference. So thank you very much. I think we still have a few minutes if you have a moment to drink some water and get your whistle back. I, I have two, I'm a two-fisted drinker here, All so right. I'm in well, we, We've got another bottle waiting yeah. for you if you need it. But if you um, would like to ask a few questions of Paula, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, it is an interesting challenge, um, and it's one that we've had for a long time. Um, and I think that over the years there is, a, there is a gap, and, you know, a lot of commercial media chase kids because, you know, with the whole idea that um, from a marketing perspective, if you can get a kid to develop a brand preference, whether it's for, 
Deer Park water or Coke or whatever it is, then um, chances are that they'll stick with it through their life. So a lot of, of the commercial media is really built on chasing kids. Um, having said that, um, the challenge that we have had in public television, and, and actually public radio has the same challenge, is that um, if you had a single television channel or a single radio channel, you have to be very thoughtful about how you're using that spectrum. And so we, on the television side, I won't, I won't speak to how radio made their determinations, but on the television side, we made a, d a decision that where we could have the biggest impact was with little kids. And so, you know, after school, uh, we're focused on children's programming, and in prime time, uh, we tend to focus more on programs for a slightly older audience because the rest of broadcast media doesn't care about us. They really, you know, they're still thinking about the 18-year-olds. Now, th there are programs that we produce that younger kids watch, um, so it's not as if we completely turned our back on, on kids. But what we have been doing is, um, is, and this is, I think, one of the things that we're really excited about is new media. Because that is what kids spend, a, I bet your kids spend a ton of time on their computer or text messaging each other. And their way of using media is profoundly different than you and I will ever use media. Um, and so what we're attempting to do, and I actually now have a lot of kids that work for me, and I, and, and I say kids and I mean literally, I mean people in their young 20s, um, that are helping us think through what we're doing online. And some of what we're doing online is taking programs that we're broadcasting, and uh, Frontline is a really great example. Um, David Fanning, who's the, who's the creator and executive producer of Frontline, always refers to the broadcast event as the executive summary, and all of the deep information uh, from his documentaries is all part of the website. Um, and so that exists and, and is ongoing. And by the way, Frontline happens to be a program that does appeal to younger, maybe not teenage, but definitely young 20s, college-age kids uh, have a very large uh, Frontline following. And he's capitalized on that. They have a Facebook page. They, um, you know, they sort of troll in the viral marketing where the kids are to put material out there because kids your daughter's age are actually very interested um, in the world around them more so than kids slightly older. So I think there's the potential there. But the other thing that we're thinking about is actually building out content specifically online that will never appear on broadcast and giving kids like your daughters an opportunity to publish some of their own work because that's the other thing they like. They like not only to hear other people's stories, they want the world to know their stories. And so they want to have the opportunity to, you know, whatever kernel you're sort of throwing out there, they want to be able to latch onto it, make it their own, mash it up, and then put it out there for everyone else to see. And so um, rather than just do what public television has done for so many years and say, yeah, well, they're going to go away for a while, but then they'll come back, we are really trying now to, to actively figure out how to keep those kids engaged and involved. So, and, and you know, they, they, the thing I will say on the radio side, I've been talking to some young people who, you know, because a lot of young kids will say, I don't want, I get all my news from The Daily Show. Um, it's not true. You can't understand The Daily Show if you have no idea what's going on in the world. They may not read the newspaper, but they're in the car when you're listening to public radio, and they may not be, that may not be their channel of choice, but they're listening, and they're picking up stuff everywhere. And I think some of them are secretly watching uh, some news, too. But we have a great season coming up with uh, Masterpiece. Um, last year, I made reference to Complete Jane Austen, which was the centerpiece. Um, I think you may have read the press that Laura Linney is, uh, is uh, coming um, on this season as the host of Masterpiece, and I think we're actually hoping that she'll be with us for the long haul. I hope you liked Alan Cummings as the host of Mystery. I think he was perfect. I've always found him to be extraordinarily creepy. Um, <laughs> but... Um, the, um, but the, the, we're kicking off the new uh, masterpiece um, season with uh, uh, new Tessa, the Dubervilles. But um, as I said, we did the complete Jane Austen. We are doing the incomplete Charles Dickens uh, with the new Little Dorrit Curiosity Shop and uh, bringing back the David, Co David Copperfield with the young Harry Potter guy. And it's a, it's a great production, and so we're really happy to have those in the, in the schedule. It's a good, it'll be a good season this year. Questions? Yes, sir. Could you just summarize briefly the, the various sources of funding, um, public and private, 
Mm -hmm. It's um, well, our funding. Um, it depends on who who you're asking the question to, whether you're asking it to a station or whether you're asking it to PBS. So I'm going to make a couple disconnected comments, and you'll be able to knit it together. Nationally, <clears throat> fifteen percent—that's one five percent of the funding for public broadcasting comes from the federal government. Some stations get some state funding. Um, the largest percentage, roughly 50 percent of the funding that comes into public broadcasting nationally comes from viewers like you. Thank you. Um, the funding that comes to, to me to make the programs and the way that we work is we're, we're sort of like a co-op is the way that um, I always like to uh, describe what PBS is exactly. We were created by the stations at a time when stations realized that there was a lot of work they were interested in doing, but each individual station alone wouldn't be able to create a news hour or a nature or a nova or great performances. And so stations came together, pulled resources, and, um, and then we went out and commissioned programming. Now, to make our dollars go even further, because if, if you look at public broadcasting around the world, I was just part of a panel with the International um, Emmys last week with the uh, head of the Australian Broadcasting and the head of NHK and the head of uh, ZDF, which is the second German public broadcasting. If you look at BBC, for example, um, they're funded about ten times greater than we are, and they're wholly government funded. Um, so, in fact, we're sadly almost at the bottom of the list in terms of, of um, democratic countries worldwide in their funding of public media. So we have to be pretty creative with how we use the federal money. And so what we do is we take the money that stations give us, and then um, we will go out and commission and we'll get producers. My old station, WNET, produces um, um, a number of programs. And we would give, um, we give at PBS, we give them about maybe 50 percent of the money, and then they go out and raise the rest through corporate support and so forth. Um, to uh, produce the programs that we have. Some of the programs we have in the schedule we largely fund ourselves. Frontline is a program that is um, that scares some corporations because it, it tackles controversial issues. And so um, it gets some foundation money, but most of the money that goes into Frontline comes from our support of it. And then other programs like Nature and Nova are programs that, you know, companies are interested. Matt, um, Antiques Roadshow is a great example. Everyone wants to support Antiques Roadshow. It's, you know, it's fun. It's safe. Lots of people watch it. Um, and so we put less money in programs like that, and so that's how we, we make our money um, extend. Do you want to comment on where your funding comes from? Because I don't know it by heart. Um, it's really very simple, and the majority of it comes from this room. As she says, for people like you, we have over 40,000 members who support us in the Atlanta community. And the two main ways that we receive money comes from individual g giving, like yours, whether it's radio pledge, TV pledge, mail, uh, major gifts, those kind of things. The other significant part of it comes from the underwriting effort that um, Jared and his team of AEs head up. The, support for WABE comes from, and it's usually somebody in our community who does that. Um, we get in an annual operating budget of about $11.5 million a year. We get a little over a million dollars from the federal government. We get no money from the state government. We get no money from the city government. We get no operating funds from the city schools. So the big pieces come from the individual gifts, the underwriting, as um, I think it's 11, 12, 13 percent is the federal government, and then there's some miscellaneous um, tower rentals and, and those kind of things, but um, that's where it comes from. That's why, yeah. as I said before, you're so important. Yeah, and that's that's pretty common. I mean, there are, um, um, you know, every station tries to be, and, and you've walked around here. I mean, this is a lean operation. They're clearly, they're not putting the money into the furniture. Um, <laughs> though it was really a great, great lunch. Um, and um, so thank you, um, uh, to Stone Soap. Yeah, I've, I've, you know, I, when I was sitting here, I said, I've, I want to remember the name of a company, and I kept thinking children's book. And, of course, that's all then I could remember was children's book. So uh, um, anyway, it's, uh, I mean, they really um, are, um, all, most of our, all of our stations, I should say, really do try to maximize the revenue that they, they bring in and look for opportunities. So as uh, John said, tower rentals, ways that you can, you know, sort of squeeze a few more 
dimes out of the work that we do is, is uh, and we do a little bit, we do a lot of that actually at the national level. So we try to leverage our money pretty heavily as much as we can. He's going to answer this question. Okay. I can tell you that now. Um, a couple of things come to mind. I mean, clearly, there must be a better way. I'm hoping in some place, there's some place there are some different ideas about the Yeah. Theory. Yeah. Um, they could be just as effective. And, and uh, I mean, clearly, I'm here because I believe in public television. I'm watching what it's doing for my grandkids now. And this is a sign of the kids and all of that. We're having a great time with all that. Um, but I do notice occasionally that the best programs are always on. Yeah. And uh, you know, I can see some of those. You know, uh, when it's not a play free, you know, when we're in a physical mode or whatever, but whatever. Um, you know, and we deal with it. Uh, but but I just I just wonder like, if at all times we go on, there have to be some ideas about how to do that. There there are, and actually, one of the things that we are. Uh, well, first, I, I will answer this for John. I won't make him answer it. I, I you know, obviously, we do it because it works. Um, uh, but. Um, we are very conscious of the fact, and part of the interest of, that I have in really expanding our work in the arts is so many of our arts programs end up during the fundraising drives, and I'd like to see a place for them throughout the year, as you said, without the 15-minute breaks. Uh, but the other thing is um, we are looking very um, hard at um, the, um, the web, and if you just look at this last presidential campaign, um, the amount of money that was raised there um, in, I think, a way that was very – uh, unobtrusive, but reached people that care about, in that case, the political campaign. But I think other nonprofits are really thinking about how do you reach people that care about issues. And I think that's a place that um, has a lot of potential for us. And so we, are, we have put together a, um, a group at PBS, and we're going to be working with a number of, of stations to try to think that through. And, um, you know, this is not a, this is not a novel idea. I, I do have the Obama people working with us, the people that built that website, not him, but the people that built the website, um, to talk to us about how they built it and what they were thinking about and how they structured it, because I think that uh, what they were able to um, accomplish in their fundraising is something where there is a lot of, of uh, analogies to what we do in public broadcasting, what any nonprofit does in trying to make its case to a group that would have interest in supporting it. Thank you all. And not to dodge that question, but I would be happy to talk with you further um, off mic about that because, no, no, um, it, it, is, it, it is a concern. I mean, one of the things that we love to do, you know, one of the most respected programs out there is NewsHour. We try pledging during news hour, and you know how much we get. <laughs> um, if that were different, um, we would do things differently. But Renee Lindsay, our director of development, Alicia Steele, who is brilliant at what she does, um, we work very hard at that, and we are trying to find a better way to do it. Because guess what? You may not like it. It's no fun to be here 18 hours a day <laughs> to sit a run. But, and, and all of the folks in that department would love to change that. But uh, if you have some creative ideas, we would really love to talk to you and, and engage with you in those because um, there will have to be a better way for us to do this as, as we move forward. I would like to thank Paula. Um, I'm kind of fond of 13s because I was born on one. Um, I was born on February 13th, so it's a good number for me. And I, I'd, like to mi I'd like to note something. During her remarks, did you notice what she said in the world of technology? When she talked about those young people, to operate those machines. Did she say VHS? No way. Does anybody, has anybody even been to where they have a VHS lately? I mean, that's how quickly things are changing. We have a little something, uh, Paula, we would like to thank you. Um, we have had some very special gifts here that Hans Frabel has created, the dogwood, and we would like to present you as a token of our appreciation with oh, one of these. And don't worry, we have a special way to wrap it and get it back <laughs> safely because it, it is glass. It's not going to fit on my carry-on. No. Right?